Father, for allowing us to come together, Heavenly Father, on this first Sunday of September. We bless your presence, King of glory. Feel this way. Oh, God. We bless you. Father, we want to just sing hallelujah until you come again. Dance in your presence and you come again, King of Glory. Feel this place. I just we bless you. We bless you. We bless you. We bless you. Thank you all. It is a good thing to be encouraged. able to be it has been at least a month since I have stood here Heavenly Father and I thank you for getting me here I um, want to first Thank Tyrone for standing in the gap and doing such a wonderful job. Uh, I enjoyed his, uh, his messages. I was able to stay home and, and listen and see what happens online. Um, and so I thank him very much for um, his standing here and doing such a great job. I, um, I guess I want to uh, confess, admit, um, Thank everybody for prayers. Let me just make all the prayers that that uh, paid for my prayed for my foot. Amen. I was um, uh, I don't want to say chastised, but I was certainly it was certainly pointed out to me that being a, a good patient is not as easy as it seems. Amen. <laughs> and let the church say amen. 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 And it, it, it got to the point where it seemed there was gleefulness of, attached to it. So I don't want to say people had a, a yeah, that too. <laughs> but if I gave myself a grade on my being a good patient, being transparent, I gave myself a, I, I thought about a C, then I thought about a C minus, then I thought about a C plus, and I'd get back to a C. So, because one of the things that happened to me is that I got, uh, I thought the doctor did a great job and, and uh, he took the stitches out and, and when I went back he said I had ripped the, the wound open and so he chastised me and gave me another couple of weeks of treatment. But my wife got an A plus for doing the bandages. Um, <laughs> amen. Amen. So, and I was, it was pointed out to me when I went back to the doctor's office that I got a C and she got an A plus. So, and since then, she has continued to maintain her 4.0 average. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it was, um, it was quite a time to be able to, to sit and have your foot up and not move and stuff, and, um, but that was what my instructions were. And finally, in the end, that's what I did. Uh, the doctor said, have you been running a marathon? What did you do to your toe? So I got, I got two visits, one Tuesday and one the next the following week. So continue your prayers that I might be released from this boot. Amen? Amen. I... And, and I say that because I put a tennis shoe on with my suit. This is the first time I ever did. I, I had to walk around with it for a while to make sure I was comfortable with that. And so I'm standing up here now, and I admit that. Amen. Thank you and bless you for carrying on and, and having a, a blessing the Lord. And thank you for all that you've done and all the prayers again. I am, um, while sitting at home, I got a chance to think and ponder and stuff, and I 
Father, where do, where do you want us to go? What do you want me to do in, uh, with this message coming in September? And so I'm going to uh, embark upon a series now, I hope three, four sermons, and we're going to see how it, how it worked out. Uh, is it going to on? No? Yes? The sermon? It's up there? Oh, there it is. There you go. There you go. There you go. Okay, good, 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 good. I just need to know that because I, I kind of wanted to. I got a, a uh, couple of things. We may need to turn the lights down a little bit so we can see this. Because I've got this show and tell thing that I worked out at home, but I don't know how it's going to pan out. Uh, but now, here's what I tell you. In about three weeks, hopefully, we'll have the projector changed out, and this will be in... Uh, a better image up here. We've already, I've kind of taken the reins on that and, and, uh, and I have entered into a contract for the, I don't know if that, um, for the replacement of it. The guy tells me that the guy who put it in tells me it's probably down to about 25% usage because there's a bulb in there. And the bulb over time, as soon as it turns on, it begins to dim, he said. And so, uh, but we're going to get a laser uh, unit this time, and so it'll be the same no matter when you turn it on or 10 years from now, it'll be the same from, from a light source standpoint. And so this will be much better, crisper, we'll be able to see it. But I'm going to try this and see what happens. So I tell you, the, the, uh, the, the, the title really of the series is going to be on the word focus, F-O, there it is, right on time. Focus. And as you can see, I tried to make sure I got a bunch of people up there who had glasses on. And, and I don't know if you can see the little kid down here in the corner. He has about four or five pair of glasses on. But it's focus. And focus um, is a term that is used to describe our point of view. And I'll start like this. Focus is, is going to be determined, is going to be defined as using your personal ideology to interpret and interact with the world. Focus is defined as using your personal ideology to interact, uh, first interpret, and then interact with the world. And the reason I say that is because it tells us what's right and wrong. Personal ideology is this, is your experiences, your ideas, your beliefs, your opinions, your principles or values that you gathered together and that's what you use to determine what is true, what is right, what is acceptable. So your personal ideology is who you are internally, but really it's your mindset and it, and it defines how you interpret what you see and how you interact with it, with the world. How do you respond one to another? And it, it drives your motives. Uh, your personal ideology frames and shapes and defines who you are. Focus being your center of attention. That means sometimes, you know, you, we see things, and we're, I'm going to hopefully test this out, on, and uh, you, you, what you see and it, it anchors your character. I'm going to give you an example of that. Essence of your mindset, the core of your life purpose, it determines who you believe you are and why you're here, your focus. And it initiates your motives. Our, mo our focus creates the uniqueness that is called whoever you are. Just fill in your name. Uh, your focus. And we're going to look at a couple of examples up here. And, I'm gonna, and what I'm going to show you, hopefully, if it works out, if you can see it, um, I'm going to put some images up here. And you can tell me if you can recognize what it is. I'm going to put, and you can tell me if you agree or not, or what you see. So the first one I'm going to put up here is an apple. Who sees the apple? Okay, do you see anything else? Who sees anything? Just raise your hand if you see something else. So I got four, maybe, some. Oh, they see it now, right? Okay, you, you're changing. What do you see? People looking at each other. Okay, all right, sounds good. Now, what's the next one? Give me the ne next one, Wayne. What's that? Who sees, who sees the tree? Now, what else you see? Amen. 
There you go. See there? See, once I start talking to you about it, you can see this stuff in it. Now, the next one. Now, this one may be a little harder. Yes, you did. There you go. <laughs> it's in the back focusing. Oh, I see the fish. Okay. <laughs> now, this is a little, little different. What, what was the first thing you saw when you looked up? Somebody just tell me. You saw the girl? Who saw the man? Who saw the girl? Oh, you saw both of them? Okay, that's pretty good. Okay. The reason I say that is because I wanted to um, walk us through and see if I did. Okay, that it. I wanted to walk us through that because sometimes, depending on who you, who you are, you see one and not the other. Somebody say, well, do you see? No, I don't see that. And once they start talking to you about it, all of a sudden your vision <laughs> changes. You say, oh, oh, no, I can see it. I can see it. Now, I'm trying to give you an idea of focus. We all have different focuses. I can tell you that. There was a class I took at seminary, and the pastor had been a pastor for 25 years with teaching. He said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, you're going to have different people in your church, no matter who you are. All these people exist in it. He said, now, whether you have two, two, 20 or 200, you're going to have people that are concerned about money. They're always going to, how much money do we spend? What's in the bank? You know, what, you know. Hold, hold, you know, they're always concerned about money. And every time you talk with them, money colors their conversation. Some people are more concerned about the corporation. Do we file our corporate papers? Did we, are we following all the rules and regulations? And, and every time you talk with them, that kind of colors that conversation. Some people are more worried about the cause. Have we saved anybody? Do we, do we have any people join the church? You so, and so every time you talk with them, you know that their conversation is going to be dictated by their focus. I hear it in men's ministry. <laughs> Yesterday morning, I could hear it. You know, when we, when we hijack the meeting, and you can tell what is important to people by the way they argue and the points they make about the same text. We, and I look down and say, did they get this out of here? And they're arguing for a half hour. No, not like five, five minutes. Two minutes. It seems like a half hour. But... Because of their focus, they see something different. Now, I'm going to hopefully see if this works out. Wayne, show me the next one. Okay, now what do you see there? Trees. 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 Who see the lips? I see two see the lips. Where are the lips? Okay, you got them. Okay, you see now? Uh, see the roots? Yep. Okay, that's good. Now, <laughs> there, well, I, I, anyway. The first time you look at it, uh, well, in the, well, I was trying to remember what, the, what the, the, the puzzle said. If you see lips, what that mean, and if you see trees and roots, what that mean, but at least you see them now. Now, wait, we're going to do the last one. Huh? There's got to be another one. Please let it be another one. There it is. Okay. Now. I want you to take your time and tell me what you see. Huh? So, um, who see the man? Okay. Anything else? Uh oh. Okay, now. Okay. Okay, now, see there? That's what I'm, now, that's what I wanted to tell you is because sometimes we can all look at the same thing and see it. Until the Lord reveals something different, then we see what the Lord sees. There was a, uh, let me, let me, <laughs> the, it's focus. Now, here's what I want you to do. Just trust me now. I want everybody to lean their head to the right. Everybody lean their head to the right. Now look at it. Do you see anything different? What's the word? I'll tell you the word so, so you won't struggle. There's a word. What's the word? You see it now? Yeah. yeah. Pat, do you see it? Okay. Because, because when you look at that, yeah, look, there you go. Look over there. It's okay. Put your head over there and you can see it. Huh? Yeah. 
Liar. There you go. Liar. That's it. That's it. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. When you, when you see stuff like that, you understand now why when we look at something and the Lord is trying to show us something different, we'd say, I don't see that. I don't see that. Until you follow his instructions, he said, lean your head to the right. And then you do, you're like, oh, there it is. We have to be open to what the Lord is leading us to do as he teaches us and be able to, it's okay to lean your head to the right to see what he's talking about. Because all of us will look at that and we'll see the brother, because I can look, it's got to be a brother because I look at his lips, right? Yeah, yes? Okay. And so he, you're thinking, man, he's sad. And he's looking down, he's very pensive. Until you lean to the right and you focus on something else. And that's what the Lord wants us to do. Um, Christians have to be open to this. Christians have to be open to refocusing on away from what the world sees and leaning their head to the right to see what God sees. You can't... You can't be resistant to leaning your head to the right. Or you keep looking at that and arguing with the Lord. I don't see that. I ain't doing that. Until you say, I got to go this way. Yeah. Oh, I see it now, Lord. That's what happens sometimes when, when there's a lesson being taught and we are sitting there and what we have learned before conflicts with what we've just been told. It conflicts with what I, what I know. It conflicts with what I've been taught. Until we relent and lean our head to the right so that we can see what the Lord is revealing to us. And sometimes that picture represents what the world has taught us. What the world has taught us is this. And we hang on to it even though God's word says something else. Because I've always done this. The people who are important to me taught me this. Amen. Amen. But just humor me and lean your head to the right so you can see. So we're going to be talking about this. And I just say this again. Christians, we need to be open to leaning our head to the right. You got to be open to that. You, got, you can't fight so hard against God's revelation that you continue to look at the brother there and not see. But it's a lie. And sometimes we find the world, the world has lied to us and we have bought into the lie and we hold on to it. The sermon series is going to be entitled Finding Your Focus in a Confusing World. Finding Your Focus in a Confusing World. The scripture I'm going to use to, to jump it off, this is making the assumption that we are going to be open to leaning, leaning our head to the right. Listen to this now. Psalm 8611 says this, teach me your way, O Lord, so that I might live in your truth. Focus my heart on fearing you. That sounds like, Lord, I'm ready to lean my head to the right. Doesn't it? Yes or no? Teach me your way, O Lord, so that I may live in your truth. Focus my heart on fearing you. And so what this has to, this, I hope this helps us overcome the resistance that we have to the revelation of God's word that we read 
And I say sometime on the plain reading of the word, that's what it says. And we don't mentally twist it to make what we know okay. That makes sense? You read God's word, I don't like that, so I twist it a little bit, and so it makes me feel comfortable, and I don't have to lean my head to the right. Michelle Williams in a song I like to hear. Anybody ever heard this song? What is it? If I Had Your Eyes. If I Had Your Eyes. You don't know that one? Okay. Well, anyway, if we find it, we're going to play it, right? Amen? Michelle Williams, If I Had Your Eyes. Now, here's a chorus in that song. People judge from what they see, but Lord, you see the whole world. If we had your eyes, we'd see things right. If we could just see from your point of view, then most things wouldn't be as they seem if we had your eyes, if we had your eyes. Now, that's a gospel song, Michelle Williams, she sings it, and, and um, that, I'm, I'm, I'm setting this up because I want to know, again, finding your focus in a confusing world, because the, the world would, would tell us a lie. And we look at one thing, we don't see it, but all of a sudden, I'm like, ooh, that's a lie. Because God showed us, and it changes your ideology, because you're the truth of your ideology determines the way you see the world and the way you interact with the world, your ideology. Fearing, though, this, this scripture I've given you, though, it talks about uh, teach me your way, O oh Lord. Teach me. That means that, that we've entered into a relationship with the Lord where I, he is the instructor, I'm the pupil, I acknowledge that he has greater knowledge than I do, and I am open to being influenced socially, intellectually, and spiritually. That that which I do know, and I think I've known for all my life, is open to change because I want you to teach me your way, Lord. That's the setup. That's the setup. I'm submitting to you, Father. The reason I want to do that is because I want to live in your truth. Not my truth or the old truth or the new truth, but I want to live in your truth. The Bible tells us that God sent his spirit to us so he would lead us into what truth? All truth. And so this is telling us, and again, I want to make sure that this is the premise of the whole series that I'm going to be teaching. And then it says, focus my heart on fearing you. Fearing you means that I reverently worship you, Father. I submit to your worship. My heart is always inclined toward you, and my character is anchored by your truth. As you know, in, a, in the, if you, if you uh, fish up here, the road up here and on the right uh, in that lake. Sometimes you get out there with your boat and you drop your anchor because you want to stay in one place. Anchor means that you stay in one place. You anchor so no matter what comes up, if a wind comes up, your anchor holds you in one place. So that means that no matter what the world throws at you, you, if you're anchored in God's truth, you stay in God's truth regardless of what the world is doing to you. Amen? Are you with me? Okay. So I just want to, you're anchored in God's wisdom, his truth, his will, his way. My focus is fixed on you. And that's what that is talking about. So the overall, it's finding your focus in a confusing world because the world will lie to us. Now, the first sermon under that series we're going to do, uh, Finding Your Focus in a Confusing World. The simple title is going to be Focusing on God. That's the simple title. I'm going to take for my preaching 
Scripture, Isaiah 26, Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. Here, um, Isaiah is writing to the Israelites about the relationship that God is offering them. And he's walking through this and he wants to tell them, here is what the Lord is offering you. It's a relationship that Lord is, is laying out and there's some blessings and benefit that he's offering. He offered to them and he's offering to you and me. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4 says that. You will keep him, him being the Israelites, him being Jerusalem, him being the nation of his people, in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you. And I did this in the New King James, so that would resonate. You've heard this before. Because he, again, Israel, believers, trusts in you. Verse 4, trust in the Lord. Now here's a command. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah, Yahweh, the Lord thy God, there is everlasting strength. Isaiah, the Amplified Version uh, says it like this, You will guard him and keep him in perfect and constant peace, whose mind, both in inclination and character, is stayed on you. Because he commits himself to you. He leans on you and hopes confidently in you. That's the nature of the relationship. And that's what our God is offering us to those that want to commit themselves to him. That their focus is not on the world, but on him. Finding your focus in a confusing world. And we're going to be looking at Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. Now, it starts off by saying this. He offers you perfect peace. Perfect peace in the Bible comes out of shalom, and shalom is a Hebrew word that means whole peace. More than just a cessation from conflict and violence, it is a wholesome, whole body, whole life peace. This includes our health, our mind, our hearts are at peace. Our faith is in the immovable God, and it produces a sense of safety that allows us to sleep soundly at night, knowing that he has dispatched his angels, and they are protecting us. So if God has angels guarding me, I can go to sleep. Amen? And I don't have to worry about what happened today and what's going to happen tomorrow, because God's got it. Amen? So now if you say that and you believe that, you have to ask yourself, why do I have sleepless nights then? Maybe because you haven't leaned your head to the right. That makes sense? Okay, maybe you haven't done that. Maybe you have read it, you understand it, but you've never applied it. And your focus is still, oh, well, they, well its focus is still on, on the world, or whatever the problem is. And you have failed to lead to the right. The Lord says, I offer you perfect peace. And in fact, the Bible tells us, and you read in there, it says, perfect peace is, is, is double peace, if you can get that. Peace is shalom, but perfect peace is more than shalom, whatever that is. But God is just putting a stamp on it and saying, look, I'm going to give you my perfect peace. If you're in relationship with me, you can have perfect peace. When you go to sleep at night, I'm sitting my angels down there. And for the two or three hours that you're going to sleep, they're going to guard you. Because we're getting to the point now where we go to sleep at 12, we're up at 2, right? Amen? <laughs> <laughs> though, we, though we dwell in a place uh, of peace here on earth, there's much like living in New Jerusalem. We are sheltered and we are protected, not by bricks with human, uh, hewn by human hands, or human gods walking the parapet. But we are watched over by the most sovereign God, the most high God. 
Psalm 91, 1 and 2 says, is those that live in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of thy Almighty. This I declare, now this is what we say. This is what we say, now we should say. This I declare about, I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge. I don't look for peace anyplace else. He alone is my refuge. I don't look for protection anyplace else. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God. I trust him. Focus. You understand? Now, this has to be your personal ideology. See, sometimes that may change what we believe and what, and what we've heard, what we've been taught. But we have to be ready to do what? Lean your head to the... Amen. We confidently declare and proclaim that our trust is in the Lord. Psalm 11, I mean 112, 7 and 8. Here's the application. Let's see if we can appreciate this. They, you and I, believers... Have no fear of bad news. <laughs> the Bible says that. You can look it up. Psalm 112, 7 and 8. They have no fear of bad news, but for their hearts are steadfastly trusting in the Lord. Most of us, if somebody called us at 3 o'clock in the morning, what do we say? Oh, God. You know, I don't want to dread, you know, now with the phone, you can look at your cell phone, you can kind of see, okay, that's from California. Wonder what they want. Their hearts are secure. They have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. Perfect peace. Perfect peace. The Lord offers his personal protection. Psalm 34 and 7, for the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and guards all those that fear him. Read it. So what I'm saying to you is, if we're going to enjoy a relationship of perfect peace with the Lord, then... Um, Should we have sleepless nights? I don't know. I mean, we have to answer that in our own selves. I don't stand here before you and tell you that I'm looking at it. I've been dealing with this for almost a month, and I'm reading this, and I'm like, Lord, I, I apologize. I'm sorry. I absolutely God, you know. And sometimes I think, I just talk about me, we think it is our duty to stay up at night and worry. Or we feel justified in it. But if we lean to the right and read God's word, he said, go and go to sleep. You can't do nothing about it. <laughs> I got it. Trust in me. I'm, I'm your refuge. I'm your safety. I'm going to give you perfect peace. Double, double peace. In perfect peace, we walk in confidence that the God of the universe is constantly working in our lives for our good. He's protecting you and I and transforming us into the likeness of Jesus Christ at the same time. So I'm not saying that we may not have trials and tribulation because Romans tells us that we are going to have trials and tribulation, right? Yes, no? Jesus told us that. He told his disciples, hey, you're going to have trials and tribulation. I'm not saying you're not going to have trials and tribulation, but you've got to realize that if God's got it, then we have to act like that. That's what I'm saying. Our focus has to be on God. I had a, I, was, let me, let me, I got an example from yesterday. And, I, and I'll say this because I, uh, the question was asked, if you murdered somebody years ago, you confessed, went to jail, did whatever,
But now you're still feeling guilty about it and it's still bothering you and, you, and you're a believer, is that the right thing to do? And so I listen, and I, and I say this out loud because I want to make sure that we know, because the, the question came up about lingering guilt. Lingering guilt. Now, certainly we should be remorseful for any wrongdoing we've done. But when we ask for forgiveness and the Lord forgives us, he tells us, I throw, I throw your sins away from you as far as the east is from the west. The sea of forgetfulness. Certainly we should be remorseful. I'm not saying that. But at some time we need to go from having that, that event cause us to feel guilty and bad to celebrating the forgiveness of the living God. You understand what I'm saying? And so now what we do, we celebrate that God forgave us. You're like, Father, I thank you. I thank you took that burden off of me. Father, you know I'm sorry. I, you know, I, I didn't mean to do it or I did it. You know, I did it and I, and, and I confess that. But your word is true. Your word is true. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you for that which you confess, and all of that that you didn't, from all unrighteousness. That's what the Word says. That's what I'm walking us into. Our focus has to be on what the Word says. Peace in every facet of our lives. He offers us Perfect peace to those that fear him. Now, if you don't fear him, that's a, we got to have another conversation. But I want to let you know, God is changing us so that my life and your life is attractive to others around us. And through me and you, you and I, all of us, others will be drawn to the, to the kingdom of the living God. And that's what you have to understand. He's drawing us. He's using us as examples, good, bad, or indifferent, to draw others. Because others have done the same thing, and they want to know, well, wait a minute. You say, wait, yeah, I did that. Really, you did? Yeah. yeah. But let me tell you what, how good God is. So when his activity in my life is for my good and his glory, he offers me perfect peace. The next part of that, he talks about the stayed mind. The stayed mind. <laughs> the stayed mind. A stayed mind is that mind that has settled the issue of who is the most important influencer in their life. A stayed mind. Steadfast mind. A steady mind. A sure mind. An anchored mind. They've settled that who is the most important influencer in my life. That's what a stayed mind is. That's the simplest definition I can give you. Now, if you're worried about Tim, John, Jim, Mary, and Joe, then you don't have a stayed mind. If that's more important than what the Lord believes or has told you or advised you or what you read, then you don't have a stayed mind. It's just that simple. James tells us that you can't have these two things. He calls you double-minded. You can't have that. You can't have this influence and that influence over there. That's a double-minded person. They don't get anything. I think that's what it says. Someone said that <laughs> the mind is like Velcro. Whatever you let in and whatever you throw at it sticks at it. So what are you letting into your mind? What are you throwing at your mind? What are you letting come into your inward parts that's antithetical to what God has told you? I'm trying to hold, well, I don't want to let it go. Why not? You can't hold both of them. Your greatest challenge is to have your mind stayed or fixed on God. That means you have settled this issue as to who's the most important person in your life. 
Your greatest challenge is to fend off all the other influences that are coming at you each and every day. Around you, by you, through all kind of, all of your senses. Psalms uh, 25 and 5 says this, lead me in your truth and teach me. For you're the God of my salvation and I will wait on you all day long. Lead me, teach me. You're the God of my salvation. But more importantly, I'll wait on you all day long. So what is that? What's the inference there? That I am patiently waiting for God to lead me into his truth. I'm patiently waiting for God to show me what is right. I don't let, I don't let people come to me and feed me any kind of stuff. I don't let people bring me junk and I keep it. Lead me, Father. Remember we started about, about, about the submission? Lead me, teach me. I'm open. I am the pupil. Lead me in your truth, Father. Teach me. You're the God of my salvation. You saved me. And for you, I'll wait all day long. When we fix our minds on Jehovah, all others concerned fade away. All others concerned are held in their proper perspective. We should be concerned about our loved ones. We should be concerned about the world, all of those. But we should see it through the teaching and the truth of the Most High God. Your ideology, your focus. We no longer have an overriding fear of what somebody else thinks or what they do. I don't laugh at what they laugh at. I don't think like they think. I don't go where they go. I don't do what they do. I don't wear what they wear. Colossians tells us this, that we need to set our mind on things above, not here on earth. This is what separates you from the world. For you died and your life is now hidden in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That separates you from the world, doesn't it? Yes, no? Yeah. So if you're sitting beside somebody who's off the chain and, you know, they didn't die. So if they see you and they're laughing, what do we say? So what? So what? Set your mind on things above, not on the things of this earth. It is okay if somebody sees, <laughs> sees you leaning your head to the right. Like Michelle Williams says, you're looking at things through God's perspective. You're trying to use God's eyes. People judge from what they see, but the Lord... You, Lord, see the whole world. If, you had, if we had your eyes, we see things right. If we could just see from your point of view, the most important things won't be as they seem. If we had your eyes. If we had your eyes. Now, Romans 8 tells us, and this is kind of maybe, I don't know, 8, 5 has a message for us. Those that think they can do it on their own end up being obsessed with measuring their moral muscle. I can do this. I can do this. I don't need the Lord. I can do this. I can do this. But never get around to exercising it in real life. Those who trust God's actions in them find that God's spirit is in them, living and breathing and active. If you're relying on your moral muscle to tell you what's right and wrong, there's a danger, according to the scripture here. Because at some point in time, you will be measuring I'm right. I know I'm right. I know I'm right. I'm, I know I'm right. Aren't I right? Yeah. 
Yes, I am. And at some point in time, you'll have people around you say, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah, I know I am. <laughs> but the scripture doesn't support that. It says those who trust God's action in them find that his spirit, and that's Romans 8, 5, by the way, is in them living and breathing and being active. A stayed mind is what I'm talking about. So a mind stayed on God is a mind that constantly trying to see things from God's point of view, constantly. That's, that's my life and lifestyle now. I say, Father, teach me, show me, I want to live in your truth. So my mind now is not filled with the world, it's filled with trying to sign. And even if I'm doing the same things I'm always doing, but I'm looking at it through God's eyes. My focus now is not on me and my moral muscle, but rather it is through God's eyes. If you find yourself, man, that takes too, too, too much time. <laughs> I'm, I'm tired. I can't be a Christian. No, I can't. No, I ain't got time for that. God has shown me how to do this, and I can do it. I don't need him for this. Beware. That may mean you're operating without God's spirit. That may mean that you're operating your, mor your moral muscle. Now, hear me clearly now. I never said you were not saved, I, you know. That is not the message. But the message is, though, that if we're going to be saved, then there's a, ne there's a next step that we have to open ourselves up so that the Lord thy God can have us look at life through his eyes. So we have to manhandle all those thoughts of independence and forcibly turn them toward the Lord thy God always seeking to abide in his truth in all things, making our minds stay on him. The next thing we talk about is abiding truth. If you read that, it, it says trust, uh, uh, abiding trust. If you read it, it says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. Now he's referring to him, that's the object, him being you and I, the Israelites, those that believe in the Lord, then four makes a command, trust in the Lord forever. So the first time he's talking about the consequence of the cause of it, then he turns and makes a command to us. Trust in the Lord forever. For in Yah, for in the Lord thy God, there is everlasting strength. The first we're talking about, you got to have you, I believe that you develop abiding trust. If you accept God's perfect peace, and then if your mind is staying on him, then your trust muscle grows instead of your moral muscle. I trust God. I trust God. I trust God. Yeah. I trust God. And somebody said, well, no, hey, hey, I trust God. I know what you're saying, but you know what, what I'm going to do? I know what you're going to do. What you going to do? You're going to trust God. Yeah, that's right. You understand what I'm saying? Let him get aggravated. <laughs> trust is the ingredient that we bring to the relationship trust is our volition trust is our submission trust is what we bring to the table God's offering the relationship but we have to trust him Isaiah is saying our trust grows as we see him working in our lives the more we see him working in our lives the more we trust him the abiding trust is a synonym for growing faith Growing faith arises out of our acknowledgement that God is working in us and through us. It's not us. The more we see him working, the more our faith grows. The more we see him working, <laughs> our trust grows as we see God's promises and commands um, being played out in our lives. Hmm. Trust him. Abiding trust. Growing trust. The promises. When you see the promises, 
when you see the, God's promises being worked out in your life. The Lord said, here's some promises. Let's look at a couple. I will provide all of your physical and spiritual needs. Here's what it sounds like. Listen carefully. So don't worry about all, at all about having enough food and clothing. Why be like the heathens? For they take pride in all these things and are deeply concerned about them. But your heavenly father already knows perfectly well that you need them. And he will give them to you. Sound like a promise, doesn't it? Okay. But what's the catch? If you first place him, for, if you give him first place in your life and you live as he wants you to do. Sometimes we don't read the rest of that, do we? No. We don't. Because we see it, at, I think it's Psalms, uh, is it 37 and 4? The Lord will give you the desires of your heart. Don't we say that? We say that just as politely. Oh, I know the Lord's going to give me the desires of my heart. We don't read the rest of it. We just do right there. But when you read, when you read what, the, what the promise is, what's the condition? What's the first condition? He's got to be first in your life. And what's the second condition? I got to live like he wants you to do. That's what he said. That's his promise. That's his promise. And read it and don't twist it to make it sound like something that he didn't say. Now, some people are probably thinking, well, wait a minute. I know people don't even love the Lord that are, that are getting everything. I know people that are heathen. They're making big money. They got a big house. They got three cars. And a boat. A little John boat. <laughs> but the, the, now let me just let me just aside. There are some natural laws that are that are operating in the world just like they're spiritual laws. And God has made them. Listen to what the Lord says. Um, hard work brings wealth. So where does wealth come from? Hard work. There is profit. The same verse in a, in a different translation. There is profit in hard work. Proverbs, that's Proverbs 14, 23. Proverbs 10, 4 Poor is the one who works with a lazy hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Whoa! So now, here's the question. Do you have to be saved to be rich? No. What do you have? What's, what's the requirement according to the word? That's all it is. That's all it is. So sometimes we draw, the, we draw the conclusion, a straight line. I know I'm blessed. Why? Because I got a good job. I got a big house. I got 15 cars. I got two boats. That ain't what the word said. The word says you're rich because you work hard. Proverbs, Psalm 34, 7 says, don't worry about those who unsaved and and gather riches because just like the blade of grass they're going to be gone soon so if we if we i, I guess i guess I'm, I'm i'm trying to make sure that abiding faith and abiding trust should be based on what god promises us not by virtue of what we twist and make the the lord say I don't know where the Lord said, I'm going to make you rich. I will uh, fulfill all your needs through my riches and glory. He said that, right? 
Does that mean God going to make you rich? No. Because he's telling us. If you put me first in your life, if you do like I want you to do, I'll, I'll give you all this stuff over here. Otherwise, you can work hard and get it yourself. Abiding trust should be built on God's diligent promises to us. His real promises that we can read and see. Because what he does, he, he goes on to tell us, beware of storing up riches. Matthew tells us, he said, you know, store up riches in heaven where thieves and moths and rust cannot attack it. That's where it will be when you get there. But otherwise, thieves, moths, and rust, you know, they're going to get it down there. Abiding trust, abiding faith should be in God's promises. Storing up treasures in heaven is accomplished through bringing others to Christ and all other acts of obedience to God's word according to his will. Bringing others to Christ and all other acts of obedience according to his word and his will. Focus on legitimate promises of God. Don't twist them to make ourselves feel good. Some may not grow in faith because they're self-sufficient and can't see God working in their lives. They've always worked hard and they've always had and they've always had and they, and they believe that that's a blessing from the Lord. I'm not saying it is not, but I'm just saying here is the formula. Sometimes our faith may be immature and underdeveloped because we have not settled on a need for God in our lives. Abiding trust, abiding faith, growing faith are all synonyms for looking at God's promises and saying, Father, I thank you. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for protecting my mind. I thank you, Heavenly Father, because you know I was about to go crazy. I, was, <laughs> I, didn't, know, I didn't know what to do. But Philippians tells us this, don't be anxious for anything. Doesn't it say that? Don't be, no, don't be anxious for some things. Three things. He says anything, doesn't it? But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request. Now, here it is. I want to go pray, but the Lord says, you know, you got to do it with thanksgiving. You can, Lord, you know what? I need this, man. You got to come on now. By 10 o'clock, the people are going to be here, so you got you, you to get it. That's not worship and thanksgiving. And the peace of God, which transition, transcends all understanding, that means we don't comprehend it, will guard our hearts. And what that's talking about, when you come and you're laying your position, and he doesn't say, leave stuff out. He said, everything you want, come on. Just don't, just, don't, just don't be concerned about that. Bring it to me so that I can sit down. We can go through your list, and I'll talk with you about it. And I'm going to guard your heart because what I'm going to do, I'm going to refocus you on the things that are important. The things that are eternal. I'm going to focus you on things that I want you to have. Now, I'm going to guard your heart. I'm going to keep you away from worrying about that stuff. I'm going to bless you with serenity that's guaranteed by heaven. He wants us to refocus. Abiding trust, abiding faith based on God's legitimate promises and command is what we enjoy. Finally, we get to the last part, and he, he begins, and he, he ends it like this, and he talked to us about the everlasting strength of the Lord. Trust in the Lord for forever, for in Yah is everlasting strength. The Lord gives us a firm foundation for our lives. He's given us his perfect peace, uh, have a mind stayed on him, abiding trust, but he gives us this daily sufficiency that helps us live 
a kingdom life. One of the great works of God on behalf of his people is to provide a solid foundation for life. As the rock of life, the Lord provides stability, security, support, defense against all stormy trials and temp uh, temptations. I will not put more on you than you can bear. I know what you can bear, but I also want you to grow. So there's this balancing act that I'm doing in your life where you think, oh man, you know, but that, yeah, you'll grow. You'll be an inch taller, don't worry, I got you. You know, because I'm your everlasting strength. You ain't got to carry all of it because I got my hands up. You, you ever had children that carry stuff with you? I, knew, I know when my, my grandson, I carry stuff and they wanted to participate. And so what I had to do was make enough room for them to get on there, but I'd have to carry and, okay, uh, uh, are we going, yeah, yeah, Papa, are we going to put it over here? Okay, well, we, you know, you, you know, they want to help. They want to be involved, right? Yes, no, you, you raise children. They want to help. They want to be in there, you know. But that's what God is doing for us. He's carrying it for us. But he wants us to grow. In, in Deuteronomy, you know, it arose back there when Moses was getting ready to go off the scene and he was telling the Israelites about going across the Jordan into the promised land. God will never leave you nor forsake you. He called Joshua up. God will never leave you nor forsake you. And so what that, that promise does, it, 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 it travels throughout biblical history, and we hear it in Hebrews. God will never leave you nor forsake you. Hmm. I will never fail you. When faith reminds us that God's in control, we need to remember that he's all we need. Our faith growing reminds us that God is all that we need. I am your sufficiency, saith the Lord. I am all that you need, saith the Lord. I will always be with you, saith the Lord. I am your source, saith the Lord. He's our everlasting strength. And so even though we may feel like we're, we're you know, we're, we're, we're weebling and wobbling sometimes, you know, he's got us. He said, oh yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, but you're gonna, you're gonna grow out of this, I guarantee you. And you're gonna be prepared when this person that I've got set up to come see you, you're going to tell them about your situation and circumstance. And you're going to be able to say, but God, but God, but God. And it's going to be genuine because I've got enough on you to let you know that it ain't about you. And I know, I know that limit. I know that limit. I know where it is. So in our daily walk, we can hear from the Old Testament, be courageous, be strong. Don't be terrified because of them. Them. You're them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He's always with you. Now in the Old Testament, God, uh, the spirit of the living God didn't commonly reside with people, but now he does. So we've got the fulfillment of that promise. And we've got to act like it. Yes, no, are you with me? For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Everlasting strength. Hebrews 13, 5 says it like this. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you or forsake you. In the Hebrews there, he was, they were dealing with people who were coming out of Judaism looking to go back. And he was talking with them about their life and lifestyle. 
And he was trying to get them to see that. Don't depend on that. Depend on that. We can walk in confidence that the God of the universe is constantly working for our highest good. He is protecting us. He's transforming us. He's making us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. He's changing us so that our lives will be attractive to others. So in this activity, in my life and your life, is for our good and his glory. So our focus in this crazy world has to be on God our Father, who loves us, protects us, always with us. Offering us perfect peace. Perfect peace. I admit that I have been up late at night walking and praying and wondering. And now I can say without a doubt that was wasted in me. It was. Because when the sun came up, I didn't change a thing. Are you with me? Anybody agree with me? I mean, just tell me. Just tell me. Just me. I didn't change a thing. So if I slept, that meant I trust the Lord. And I, and I knew he had an angel guarding me. Guarding my eyes. I knew that. Intellectually, I knew that. But in application. So, the sermon series, finding your focus, your ideology, and I'm hoping and praying that we are going to hear a pathway or a process of changing our ideology, that we will be open to looking and leaning to the right and not be resistant. To the revelation of God. As he says, here's what it says. Let's sit before the Lord and allow him to reveal it to you if you don't believe the teaching or the influence. But don't reject it. Because what I heard, taught, saw, Teach me your way, O oh Lord, so that I may live in your peace. Focus is defined as you your person's ideology to interpret and interact with the world, interpret what you see, and then interact with the world. We talked about finding your focus today, but A simple title was focusing on God. If we accept that peace, we can develop a stage legitimate promises that the word says and seeing him work those out in my life. I don't set up a promise that I think the, the Bible says something and then I, I, I run with that. 
I remember, Reverend Smith, I mean, uh, Yolanda told us a long time ago that her father had said it so much to her, she thought this was a promise in the Bible. It said, uh, what is it? Cleanliness is just like godliness. And she said it was only until she could read the Bible for herself and realize that was her daddy manipulating her. Abiding trust. Our faith or trust grows from understanding the legitimate, legitimate promises of the Lord and see them work out in our lives. Finally, we, let's enjoy God's everlasting strength. One of the great works in God's economy and his kingdom is providing a solid, stable foundation for our lives. He provides security, stability, defense, support for all trials and tribulations that come throughout our lives. In perfect peace, let us have a stayed mind experiencing Pray briefly. We're going to sing, give opportunity for those that hear or online and accept. The Lord. Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you, Father, for your word, Father. I thank you, Father, for trusting me and giving me at least taking me and showing me myself Heavenly Father in all of these areas Father it is a gracious promise to, that you've given us that you want to give us your perfect peace Shalom a peace in our lives Heavenly Father that passes all understanding a peace Heavenly Father that includes our health welfare Heavenly Father our families all kinds of peace Heavenly Father because we believe in you know who you are and you will do what you see. You're sovereign. You're sovereign. So Father, I pray that you might help us in this area of having a stayed mind, Father, because we are, we're fickle, Heavenly Father, because today it will be you and tomorrow it might be somebody else, Father, but you, you know our frame, Heavenly Father, you know we are made from dust, Heavenly Father, so I know you're not going to stop loving us, Heavenly Father, but give us Give us a high sign. Give us roadblock, whatever, just to let us know, Father, that you're still there and that we should not allow others to be influenced in our lives. Give us an abiding trust, Heavenly Father. Let us look to your word so that we can see the legitimate promises, Heavenly Father. And not turn them to the left and to the right. But rather, Father, we look at the trust of the, the Lord and follow you according to your word and your wisdom, Father, in your word. Father, I pray that we will walk in your everlasting strength, Father. I pray for everybody in here. Because at some level, Heavenly Father, we all need to learn to lean our heads to the right to see what you see. To have your perspective. Let us not have little energy. Let us not be tired in serving you. Bless us, Father. We focus our lives, Heavenly Father, in such a way that we honor you. And as the scripture says, Father, I pray that we might desire to teach, to learn from you. For you, you teach us, Heavenly Father, to learn from you, Heavenly Father, to walk in your truth, have a sincere and eager desire to walk in your truth, Heavenly Father. And in the end, Heavenly Father, focus on fearing you. To bless us. Father, if there are those that are here or online, Heavenly Father, that, that want to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior, we offer this prayer, Heavenly Father, the sinner's prayer. Father, we, we come confessing that we are sinners. We believe, Heavenly Father, that you sent Jesus to die. We believe that he's the son of the living God. We believe, Heavenly Father, that he was crucified. He died, Heavenly Father. And he got up on the third day with all power 
in his hand and he mounts it to your right hand. We believe, Heavenly Father, you sent the Holy Spirit now to indwell those that believe in you. We accept it, Heavenly Father, by faith. By faith, Heavenly Father, that his blood paid the penalty that was required for our sin. Now, Father, I, I pray that we might open our lives, Heavenly Father, invite him in so that he will become our Lord and Savior. Take control of the throne of our heart. Sit on the heavenly Father, direct us, lead us, and guide us, so that we will become the, the men, the women, the people that honors you all that we do, as we are being transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ in preparation, Heavenly Father, for the eternal promise in heaven. We bless you, Father. We bless you. I pray, Heavenly Father, that anybody that heard those words, Heavenly Father, that expresses their desire to honor that you might hear it and confirm in your heart that you heard it and they are saved. We bless you, we bless you Father. Now we ask and claim, Father, all these blessings in your son, Jesus Christ's name, we say, Amen, Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Though none have come, there is still room at the foot of the cross. Amen. We're going to uh, have our communion service. Afterwards, we'll do the offering. So we're going to break now, go, and come back, and then we'll have a communion service. Then we'll do the offering afterwards. That's all.
you thank you. behind that you have to be you just know that Christ is risen he's not on the cross anymore we bless you we come today on the first Sunday of September uh, to participate in a communion service we come celebrating the death burial and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we know that he was crucified we know that he was bear it we know that he rose on the third day we know that we believe that he's on the right hand of the father now interceding for us and that helps us to understand how he can be the propitiation for our sins past present and future because these are everlasting everlasting savior and so as we come and and celebrate. Know that not only here in this local body, but we join the united body all over in this celebration. And we believe these elements are not his body and not, but they are symbols. And so, but we are here as believers. Amen. I pray that our hearts are are ready to receive but we're going to pray making sure that we give opportunity to everybody to forgive and position themselves to come truly to this celebration we'll ask that you might bow your heads we're going to ask Tyrone to pray pray over us but let us be sincere so that our celebration will honor the Lord amen let us pray. Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we ask that you would look into our hearts, Lord. We ask that you would reveal to us what is not like you. And we ask that you would forgive us for all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you that your word says that you are faithful and just to do, to do uh, just that, Lord God, to forgive us. And we thank you that you're a living God, as Pastor has just said, that you are not still on the throne, that you beat death and you raised in power. Amen. We come here today. Yes, Father. To do what you told us to do. This yeah. is an ordinance. Mm. We want to follow orders and we want to partake of the elements. Yeah. We just want to do so with the right mind yeah. and the right heart. We love you, Lord. We pray that you will focus us in this serious time of the church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs>
Bible says that at the beginning of the dinner, the supper, Jesus took the bread and his blood and he passed it around. He held it up and he said, This bread represents my body that was broken for you. Sacrifice for you. He tells us that this is a celebration of what he did. And so now let us eat and celebrate it. fourth cup of the night, the Bible said that he's telling us that it's wine that we share with our mission seat. Tell us that we need to know the cup. We need to know the cup. As often as we
those are online and all those here, I pray that the Lord will bless you all this week. Amen? Amen. Amen.